Chapter 11. Yeah, the chapter of bankruptcy, by the way, but that's another story, another issue. Chapter 11. Um, Jackson, he was the first of our presidents who actually grew up poor. I don't think James Madison really grew up rich, but he had some privilege. Uh, anyway, he was uh, orphaned at the age of 14 when his father died. At the age of 17, he fought in the American Revolution and his older brother was killed. He himself was taken prisoner. And one day an officer in the British Army threw his boots at Jackson and said, here, sign my boots. Jackson said, I am not your slave. So the officer took out his sword and struck Andrew with it. And Andrew Jackson carried a scar the rest of his life. I mean, the officer struck him pretty hard. Um, he was an Indian fighter. And again, that's why one of our presidential candidates said she'll take his portrait down off the White House. Um, but anyway, um, he appeared to many to be a self-made man. He convinced people that anyone could move up the social ladder, whether it's born to the top or not. This was something that almost never happened in Europe. If you were born in poverty, you stayed in poverty. There were exceptions. If you were born rich, you stayed rich. All right. Transportation early on was still slow. Roads, though, eventually began to improve. Um, as roads improved, travel became cheaper. Now, here is a story about roads. Roads were okay, except when it rained or when the snows melted. And when the snows melted, especially roads could become extremely deep. And a person, in some cases, could literally knee deep in mud or at least ankle deep in mud if you were lucky. And this made it really difficult to pull wagons over roads. But eventually they learned to put gravel on roads, to put wood on roads, even though the wood would eventually rot. They'd keep putting down uh, planks to make roads out of planks. And gradually they began to pave roads, even though paving roads in those days was expensive. John Quincy Adams well, the first five presidents did not spend any money. President number six, John Quincy Adams, tried to change that policy on road building. Congress did not cooperate with him, as I've already mentioned. So John Quincy Adams did not see his road building uh, come to pass. In fact, John Quincy Adams, thinking he was doing the right thing, left the presidency very disillusioned and spent his last years in the House of Representatives. Um, stagecoach travel became commonplace, and as the roads got better, got faster. The stagecoach was usually pulled by four or six horses, sometimes more. <clears throat> and inside the stagecoach, you had two seats that faced each other. They were made of wood. The driver sat outside, and if it rained or if it snowed or whatever, sleet, the driver got the brunt of it. You might say, well, the horses got the brunt of it too. But um, most of you have probably never seen a stagecoach. I've only seen very few of them myself. Uh, but uh, at one time it was the main way of travel. And it's only been about 130 years ago since stagecoach travel went out of style. Now, to help improve things, in 1807, Robert Fulton made a steamboat. His steamboat um, was paddled by paddle wheels, not by propellers. Today we know that this is less than efficient. Um, he would have gotten better efficiency out of his steamboat if he had used a propeller, but they did not know how to make propellers in those days. That was to come later. So Robert Fulton's steamboat used big, large paddles, paddle wheels. Um, they called it Fulton's Folly at first. In fact, when Fulton first tried to demonstrate it, it didn't work. The people on the shore pointed toward it and laughed. Hilarious, they said, look at Fulton's folly. Fulton shouted back, now wait, just give me a few minutes. He went in, made some changes, and the steamboat's wheels started turning to the embarrassment of the people who a few minutes ago been laughing at him. But anyway, typical example of people who said it couldn't be done. The early steamboats were dangerous, and here's why, folks. 
Today we can we could make them, if we were to make them today, we could make them better than they did. Because today we know how to make metal that has uniform strength throughout the metal. But in those days they would make the boilers doing the best they could, but the boiler might have a weak spot in it. Might be strong in one part of it and weak in another. And nobody knew where the weak spot was. Now I mean I spent 27 years at Lockheed and I learned how to test metal for hardness, to test metal for strength. And we now can send some sound waves into metal and get reflections back from the waves and tell if this metal is safe or not to use. But notice that they didn't have any of that. A lot of boilers blew up. A lot of steamboats caught fire. And a lot of persons would have to jump in the water to escape the steam. But if it's difficult for a woman, because for a woman to jump in the water dressed in heavy clothes, which the women wore in those days, meant that they likely highly likely could drown. So the early steamboats were dangerous, but people used them anyway. Particularly, they were used on the Mississippi River. Now, to get down the Mississippi River, it was easy. It just simply floated along the river. But getting back up again, most people who went to New Orleans from either Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, or Missouri, most people who went down the Mississippi River wound up walking going back up because it was really difficult to row a boat, uh, almost if I row a boat against the Mississippi's current. So they'd go down the Mississippi River, float down, and then walk back home. Uh, Oftentimes they used logs, the uh, log raft, that they get down, and then the, the log raft, you may know, it will float, but it's extremely heavy. All right. Um, the Supreme Court ruled that no state could grant monopoly on a river that bordered more, more than one state. And you may know most rivers do. The Ohio River borders several states. Uh, the Mississippi River borders several states. So only rivers inside of a state could, which could states grant monopoly. So uh, this was the first time, I believe, in history that the Supreme Court ruled on the subject monopolies. We are going to have a lot more to say about monopolies when we come to the late 1800s and early 1900s. The government all tried hard to outlaw them. Now, the Erie Canal ran from Albany to Buffalo. Well, the Hudson River went from New York, to, basically the Hudson River from the Atlantic Ocean to Albany. Then the Erie Canal went from um, Albany to Buffalo and joined Lake Erie there at Buffalo, New York. That meant the Atlantic Ocean was now connected to Lake Erie. Canal building was important because the canal only had to be about four feet deep. And even a, a half lame old horse, just one horse is all it took to pull the barge. The horse would of course be on the side. They have a path on the side for the horse. And you might say, wouldn't that barge tend to be pulled toward the bank. Yeah, but they had a man on the inside the barge. You would use a stick to keep the barge away from the bank. Sometimes they used two horses, one on one side of the canal and one on the other. And again, it did not take strong horses to pull the barge. It weighed several tons. What this meant was a large volume of goods could be moved over land real easily with very few horses and very few men. And. Um, Canals were built in Ohio, built in Pennsylvania. They are largely out of use. One near my own home in Middletown parallels the Great Miami River because the Great Miami River is not deep enough for a barge. But anyway, um, railroads came into use, and by the 1840s, canal building stopped. Here was the disadvantage of canals. Winters were cold in those days and they still are up north. And the canal would often freeze up and there was no way to unfreeze it. When the canal froze up, there'd be nothing you could do but wait until the canal thawed. And that meant that most of the winter, you could not use a canal. But then the railroad came. The railroads could carry a lot more uh, cargo and even passengers. And the railroads got better and better as time went on. And uh, the rail completely replaced the canal. Now, if you stop to the train track, 
create a train intersection where you don't have very many of them. Well, most trains now have overpasses or underpasses. If you're stopped, if you see Baltimore and Ohio, you'll think that was the nation's first big railroad. And yeah, it started at Baltimore, ended up in Ohio. Now, the Baltimore and Ohio was the nation's first railroad. In short order, the United States had more rail than all of Europe did, except for maybe Great Britain. And to this day, railroad is the cheapest way to carry the most goods. It's not necessarily the fastest, but uh, I mean, all right, you'll see often rail, rail cars carrying truck beds. Sometimes these truck beds have their wheels still on, but they now have a way to take the wheels off the truck bed and get more trucks, truck, near the back, the trailer on a tractor trailer system. They have more ways to, they can get more uh, trailers on a rail car, and it saves money because they don't have to pay the truck drivers. A uh, truck can go up for thousands or more miles, hundreds of miles, and then at the end of the line, they put the wheels on it again, and the truck can go wherever it wants to. So uh, trucking firms and rail companies have gotten together. Again, the rail road being the cheapest way to get a large volume of goods across the country. The earliest factories were spinning mills. In other words, they found a way, I mean, the old fashioned way of spinning yarn or spinning wool or spinning cotton was the spinning wheel. And the spinning wheel would take the cotton and spin it into a string. But then they found ways to run several of these at once, a whole lot of wheels at one time. And this was done in factories. They would employ adolescent girls of minimum wage. Now, they knew that if they kept these girls on, they were permanently impoverished. So they'd employ these girls for a few years, and then when they got married, they'd retire them. And that way, there would not be a permanent force of minimum wage workers who'd be permanently poor, like there was in England. But this did not last long. The female labor force came to be known as the Waltham system. The young women would only work a year or two, and a lot of women flocked to factories believing that what little money they made would lead them to a better life. But then the factories began to hire women permanently. Now, folk, I want to say this. I mean, I spent 27 years at Lockheed. If Lockheed would hire a worker and keep them a year or two, the company would go out of business fast. It oftentimes took six months to 12 months to train a worker to properly do a job. And the Lockheed was able to keep its employees because they paid more than anybody else around and still do. So that way the employees were tempted to stay until they retired. I did. Any of them could have left any time they wanted to, but most of them didn't. Um, also, they knew Lockheed workers worked slowly. Why? Because the product we were building had to fly when it was done. The, the quality mounted more than the speed. I mean, the quality mattered more than the speed. So they um, had to have quality workmanship, and oftentimes haste made waste. So Lockheed employees were known for working slowly, and most of the time you knew that, hey, once you've been to Lockheed, you won't get a job anywhere else, which was true in a lot of cases. So a lot of them stayed here until they retired. But that was then. For these type, this type of work, just making yarn, making string, um, it did not take highly skilled workers. The extremely highly skilled workers were to come later. A lot of female workers went on strike, and the, what the unions would do was simply replace the workers. So the early attempts to form unions were ineffective. Now, I can tell you this my Aunt Rosie, who worked at a sewing factory in Jamestown, Kentucky. That sewing factory, by the way, is now out of business. But she tried to form a union one time. The company found out about it and fired her. She never got back on at that factory. Uh, she's still alive, really old by now, but it's been, I guess, 40 or so years ago when she was a young woman, she tried to form a union. They caught her. Uh, yeah, this still goes on, folks, just to let you know. Um, if a worker tried to get better wages, the company would fire him and hire someone else for low wages. Now, folks, this still goes on in places. I mean, I could name a man who was working as an engineer at a local radio station, 
They were paying him a good bit of money because it was good, but one day they called him in. The boss was just crying. I'm sorry, we have to let you go. We don't have the money to pay you. Fired him and hired someone else at a much, much lower rate. Uh, this, this is a fact of life, folk, and it still goes on. Banks increased greatly. Banks would write bank notes, and these bank notes would be used as money. Uh, just to give you some idea, I mean, pretend like this is a bank note. The banks would write a certain amount on it and then give it as payment to some customer, and then these customers would in turn trade your bank notes for goods and services. If you had been a worker then, you might work for a man, and he'd pay you in a bank note, and you knew that you could take that bank note to the bank any time and get some money, but often you'd use that bank note instead to go to your store, and your store clerk would take the bank note as payment. This practice now has since been outlawed. The federal government in those days did not issue paper money, I want to quote the Constitution, Congress shall have power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. It doesn't work anymore. The Federal Reserve takes, has taken that power. The Federal Reserve decides the value of money. If any of you think I'm wrong, you're welcome to tell me. This is the way it is. But anyway, it is in the Constitution. So Congress would issue coins, but not paper. That was to come later. Counterfeiting flourished. Bankers had a lot of control over the economy, and they would decide who would get loans and what interest rates. The poor people would have to pay a higher interest rate than the rich much too often, and the bankers would oftentimes refuse to loan to the poor. This can still go on. I mean, if you uh, try to buy a car, your credit score is out in the open for anybody to look at, unless you've frozen your credit. In that case, before you buy a car, you have to unfreeze your credit. Now, does anyone of you know what I'm talking about? A few of you nodding your head. Anyway, but you have to have your, remember, they have to look at your credit score, and they just decide, no, your credit score is too low. You're making too little, and uh, this car is too expensive for you. They can turn you down for a loan. Still yet. I see one person nodding his head like you know what I'm talking about. Believe me, I do too. So <laughs> no, they're the only one. But they can turn you down for a car. Um, but they can turn you down for a house also. If you don't have enough money to pay, make, not make enough money to pay for that house, they can deny you the, in, the entry into that house. Uh, but now, um, anyway, Jackson believed that these privileges should be ended. And he wanted to destroy the banks because he said that this would make economic opportunity more for everybody and not just for the elite. Now, folk, I want to say this. About 10 years ago, let's see, no, 11 years ago, in 2008, we had two big lending institutions, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, collapsed. And they collapsed because <coughs> one of our presidents had said that the loaning system too much favors the rich, and we must have a system that gives more. So they forced these loan companies to loan money to people who could not afford to pay, to the poor people. And this went on for years. It, took, it didn't happen overnight. It's not like the, Fed, the president ordered the banks to uh, loan money to poor people, and then the next day the economy collapsed. From the time the president ordered to the time the economy collapsed was about 30 years, folk. <clears throat> it took that long. But eventually this decision led to a big collapse and uh, Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac about went under. But again, the federal government moved in and bailed them both out. This might have been a little bit before you can remember. But so these things are still issues. Um, all right, panic of 1819. We were to have several more panics 1837, 57, 77, and 97, notice those come every 20 years apart. And a lot of economic, economic experts say that uh, the way our, the human mind works and the way that the economy works, there will be ups and downs. <coughs> Essentially though, what happens is the economy will grow for a while and then people will develop too much confidence in it and they'll uh, think, hey, it's gonna keep on growing forever and they'll overinvest, and this will bring the economy down. Then it goes back up, and then back down, and back up. 
there are times of boom and bust. What our government now tries to do with the Federal Reserve is when the economy seems to be growing too fast, they'll um, raise interest rates and raise taxes to cut off the highs and then fill in the lows. When the economy is going down, they lower taxes and lower interest rates to try to get more money in the economy and uh, cap off the highs, fill in the lows to keep the economy supposedly more on an even keel and to keep the economy from extremes extreme certain people. Now, this has worked for several years. A lot of people fear that this tampering with the natural processes is one of these days going to lead to the worst depression we have seen in our country's history. I don't mean to scare you, but I mean just say in fact, this is something that possibly could happen. Um, particularly the last economic downturn, the one in, the, the big one, the one in 2008, the federal government lowered interest rates and did not boost the economy. The federal government cut taxes, it did not boost the economy. What well, did, they lowered interest rates some more. You might not be aware, but in some places in the world, Japan is one and some European countries, they've lowered interest rates to the point for where that to get the bank to save money, you've got to pay the bank interest instead of the bank paying you interest. So you put $1,000 on a bank and you have to pay about four or $5 a year or maybe even more, just so that that bank will have the privilege of saving your money for you. It's called negative interest. Can the world last that long, much longer on that? But anyway, um, now, here's what happened. Um, there was demand right, when the economy was high. I mean, in 1816, 1817, and 1818, we'd had really good years, and a lot of people then became tempted to invest more. This was happening again in the 1930s, so we've had our worst, the worst depression in history. People thought, hey, the stock market always goes up. So they just simply borrowed money to buy stock, and then all of a sudden the market crashed. Well, inflation set in as the people we're hoping for high yields. Now, if, for the word inflation, you don't hear much talk about it right now, but when Jimmy Carter was president, big thing, inflation is where, all right, we once paid 32 cents a gallon for gas. When I was as young as most of you look like you are, we paid 32 cents a gallon. Today it's up to about 260 or 270, at least here. In some places it's up even more than that. California, I believe, is paying about 330 a gallon for gas. And most of Europe is paying six and seven dollars a gallon for gas. Really, really high prices. But anyway, that's inflation. Where that the money you have is not worth as much as it once was. Now, when inflation sets in, people on fixed incomes are hurt because their money does not have the buying power it once had. Well, the bubble of speculation grew and grew and grew as the bubble got higher and higher and higher and one day it burst. And it all happens at once, quite often. Um, the second bank called in its loans now. Called in, this is something that can't happen today. Well, it can't. But let's say if you take out a car loan and you sign an agreement to pay a certain amount a month, as long as you're making that payment, the bank has to leave you alone if you sign a home mortgage, and as long as you're making a monthly payment on that home mortgage, the bank, so the bank just can't write you a letter and say, whoops, we've run into economic problems, we have to have the money that you owe us, pay it all up now. Today's banks can't do it. Now, they can do it. If you get behind on your payments, and you get so far behind, they can say, hey, pay it all now. Um, but other than that, they can't just decide to call. But anyway, the second bank called in its loans. But when they did that, the state banks did the same thing. All of a sudden, with people having to try to pay the loans of the money they owed to banks, they didn't have money to buy much of anything else. The loans themselves had been used as money. So there was now less money. In Europe also, there was a financial crisis. And folks, this was the first time in the history of the world where that you had a, an economic downturn that affected both sides of the Atlantic. 
In the years past, one country might be prospering, its neighbor going down, but now the world economy began to become so tied together that when one nation goes down, another one goes with it. And uh, this is still the case. Um, anyway, every American who was tied to the economic system, I say who wasn't, some farmers who were self-subsistent, grew all their food and didn't need much money, they were not affected. But a lot of people lost their savings and lost their property. I mean, if you take out a loan to buy a property you don't pay, the bank will come and take it. You take out a loan and to buy a car you don't pay, the bank will repossess that car. They don't like to. It costs them a lot of money and they try to avoid it. Now I'll tell you this about repossessed cars. They can be really cheap sometimes, cheaper than normal. But uh, of course a lot of times when a person really like, can't pay, he'll do all kinds of damage to the car before he lets it go. So sometimes it's a bargain, sometimes it's not. All right. A two-party system took shape, even though the parties did not have names yet. Oh yeah, the, the Panic of 1819 was the one and only time in our country's history when the president was not blamed. One and only time. Every other downturn we've had, in 1837 they blamed Martin Van Buren, in 1857 they blamed James Buchanan. 1877, Hayes, and so on and so forth. And then they wound up blaming Robert Cleveland later. Um, and of course, during the Great Depression of the 30s, they blamed Herbert Hoover, with some justification, I will say. But the president gets blamed about the big downturn in 2008. There was some blame to go around to one of our presidents. The president who might have been most at fault was Jimmy Carter, but he'd been out of office for 30 years. It took that long for his policy to, you might say, ripen to a big downturn. But who got blamed? George Bush, who was in office at the time. All right. Um, Jackson was the first presidential candidate to have a name, an affection name. He's called Old Hickory. If you know anything about wood, hickory is a very strong kind of wood. At one time they made a few baseball bats out of hickory, but it's heavy, so now they make almost all bats out of ash. That's the wooden bats, that is. And the major leagues are still required to use wooden bats. Colleges are allowed to use aluminum bats, and they go ping, ping every time you hit the ball with them. Wooden bats, uh, they don't, baseball doesn't want to change because they would make the it would change the game too much. Uh, they want the game to be played the old way, I guess. But anyway, hickory is a strong kind of wood. Um, one group called itself the Adams Party, the other group called itself the Jackson Party. But at least in name, both groups were Republican. Uh, these men, both of them wanted to claim they were successors to Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe, who were Republicans, so they both called themselves Republican. But today's Democratic Party is the one that once had the name Republican. The Democratic Republicans eventually adopted, dropped the name Republican and took on the name Democrat only. As for the National Republicans, they eventually shortened their name to Whig. We'll talk about why in a little bit. All right, 1824... That election had gone to John Adams in 1828. By this time, four years later, more and more states were giving the electoral vote to the common people. Um, and character became an issue. Jackson was pictured as being a rich, or Adams was pictured as being a rich elitist. Jackson was called the son of a prostitute. Uh, again, if any of you knew the way these country people in the backwoods lived, uh, but nevertheless the charge probably was untrue, but whatever. Now, here's the word really to hurt Jackson though. In those days, a man would be walking from one place to another, and as nightfall would set in, he'd find a door and knock on a door, and uh, the owner of the house would expect to take him in. Well, Jackson was walking in the Tennessee, and he saw this house. He knocked on a door, 
And a pretty young woman answered the door, and they felt it was like love at first sight. But as Jackson, was, of course, they took him in and uh, kept him, they realized he was a really popular hero. But as he got to talking to her, he learned that she, had, she was still married. She was married to a man who had been a soldier, an Indian fighter. But he was suffering what we today might call PTSD. He was angry, brutal, and quick to th uh, just simply, nobody knew what would set him. His family said this was something the war did to him. He was not that way before. But anyway, Rachel could not live with him, so she went back home to her parents. And then all of a sudden, Jackson came into her life. Well, she told about her marriage, so he uh, said, well, I'm a, I've been a judge. I can get you a divorce. And at this point, folks, the facts become blurred. There's all kinds of stories about what went on. Make a long story short, Jackson and Rachel were married, and then somebody pointed out, hey, where's your divorce paper? Uh, we, it's with the justice of the peace, we think. No, sure, she, and, well, they got a divorce for sure. And then they had another ceremony, but by that time the damage was done. Jackson's wife was called an adulteress and a whole bunch of other names. She became an angry, bitter, soured up woman. He took it out by dueling. He killed two men in duels, and this was an issue. But, now, about the duels, the last man he dueled, I mean, since Jackson issued a challenge, the other man had the right to pick the weapon, he chose pistols, and the other man was to fire the first shot. He did, he fired a shot that landed right inside Jackson's chest. Didn't kill Jackson, not then anyway. Jackson fired his shot and killed the other man. But Jackson was to suffer the rest of his life. He had lead poisoning, he was often sick, and he was in pain. In those days, doctors did not know how to remove a bullet that was lodged deep inside a person. They did not have anesthesia, not yet. That was to come later. So, um, anyway, Jackson said, I'm going to the White House with my wife by my side. He almost did. When the election returns were in, Jackson won the election. When his wife heard the news that he'd won the election, she lived a few days and all of a sudden killed him with a heart attack, leaving Jackson a widower. John C. Calhoun was chosen as vice president in the election. He run the vice president, so he got to be vice president. At this point, political parties were become a permanent part of the political landscape. Uh, Jackson had said he'd go to the White House steps with his wife by his side. Instead, he climbed the White House steps alone. He went to the White House alone. Um, the other men before him, the other presidents would appoint men of different persuasions to try to placate all parties. Jackson said, only my men are to be appointed. He was no follower of John Quincy Adams. He appointed a rich man, Martin Van Buren, for Secretary of State, and Van Buren became the next president. When he found out that his official cabinet did not have to do exactly what he wanted, he picked a bunch of unofficial men called the Kitchen Cabinet, <clears throat> made up of his closest supporters. These men he could not pay, but at least they would meet and they would advise him. They would serve as advisors. He used the veto more than all the other presidents combined, before all the six presidents before him. Every one of his vetoes was sustained. They did not have the votes in Congress to override him. But in what Congress wound up doing, and this is a practice that continues to this day, the bills he vetoed, Congress would attach them to other bills that Jackson had to accept or to run the government, and the president were not given, was not given line item veto. Now, President Clinton said, give me line item veto and I'll balance the budget. President Eisenhower wished he had line item veto, where the presidents could veto lines in a bill and keep others. The Supreme Court, though, ruled that this is unconstitutional, so presidents either have to sign the whole bill or sign none of it. Um, now, Jackson set up what's called the spoil system. That's not in the notes, but essentially he said anybody can run the government, so he would give off give jobs to persons who had supported him. This was to last until President Garfield was shot a couple of generations later, because the man who shot him said, "I've supported you, Mr. Garfield. You should give me a job." And. Uh, 
most people who assassinate your leaders wind up regretting it. As for Grito, the man who assassinated Garfield, he was hung. All right. Now, Jackson and Clay were enemies, political enemies. Clay wanted a road built between two cities in the state of Kentucky. Jackson said, I'm not going to sign <coughs> to build a road with two cities in the same state. He used that as excuse. He upset Clay, but again, Clay could do nothing about it until Jackson got out of office. There wasn't enough votes to override Jackson's veto. Now, Jackson at one point challenged Henry Clay to a duel. Henry Clay said, I don't believe in that. I'm not going to, and this, I'm not going to do it. This encouraged other men from then on to simply say no to the idea of dueling until today it's considered foolish to issue a challenge. Women began to change roles, began to change duties. The men spent more and more time away from home. The wives then were left to tend the home. The man's work seemed more disconnected, particularly as men began to get out and work at factories or work for other people doing other stuff besides farming. Um, men would work for the money while women worked inside the home and both gained from this rain. Okay. Um, Everybody then, uh, let's see, after before I leave, let me write something down so I know where to start next time. Okay, okay. All right, everybody have a good weekend. I hope to see you all on Monday.